for us all some revenue at 3.17 billion euros, up 4.2 percent year over year. Reporting third quarter sales of 4.8 percent. Franklin Golf Romeo. The Fed policy will be driven by the pace of the data. Same policy will remain accommodative. Of the mix of concession flow still down about a percent on the day for a little more than four pennies. special presentation from John Carter from simpleroptions.com. Um, and to start with our introduction, we actually have Seth Freudberg on, who's going to share very quickly about SMBU and the options tribe. So Seth, go ahead and uh, tell us about that. Sure. That's great. And thank you, Andrew. Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Seth Freudberg. I'm the re director of uh, options training here at SMB uh, and also the head options trader on our options trading desk. Chief of the Options Tribe, and Andrew and I are sort of uh, partners in crime on the Options Tribe, and we have been for many, many years. And uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, for today's special presentation of John Carter's Squeeze Indicator that everyone has heard, you know, so much about. Um, today's uh, webinar is, you know, part of a, uh, an ongoing educational effort on the part of SMBU's Options Tribe to bring to the table, you know, the, the best options traders uh, in the world to present to help our community members to up their game. You know, it's our culture to bring, uh, you know, the top people to the to the uh, to the table every week. And um, the way we see it, we're we're helping our community members to learn from these great traders. And then, as some of you bubble up and become, you know, outstanding traders. They, uh, you, you apply to our options trading desk, and a number of the fortunate, you know, folks have gotten to trade uh, on our desk. We back, uh, we back folks with capital once they become excellent traders. So it makes all the sense in the world for us to uh, put forth great education for everybody uh, as frequently as possible. And bringing a guy uh, of John's stature to the options tribe today is is an is is an example of that, a big example. So with that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, the SMB really sh started and is in it, at its core today a proprietary trading firm, and uh, we trade real capital. Uh, when the market moves big, it may not be the greatest thing for options income traders, uh, but it is fantastic for almost every other kind of trader. And uh, on on Monday, for example, uh, our firm actually uh, our trading firm made fifty four million dollars. Um, uh, trading basically the flash gap, I like to call it, uh, what happened on Monday. And for a, a day trader or a directional trader, guys like John Carter, um, who do, you know, sort of both, uh, those are the kinds of days that, you know, can make your year. Uh, and so we're, you know, we're really excited to take, uh, you know, we're, we're this hybrid firm. We do uh, capital we provide capital to top traders. That's really at the core of what we are. And we love to educate uh, people in options trading, in day trading, uh, and so forth. So anyway, uh, just really wanted to, to give everyone a context for today's session. Uh, and with that, I, I am really uh, uh, proud to present John Carter of simpleroptions.com. Uh, Andrew is going to be the host of today's uh, webinar. So Andrew, you go ahead and uh, and uh, I will watch. Great. All right. Thank, thanks for the quick update. We uh, delayed our options try meeting that took place, that usually takes place every Tuesday uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, just because of the, the volatility in the market and really just having to focus mostly on trading and taking care of the desk and our individual positions and really just was an overwhelming uh, process. And now that we're kind of through that, this, this meeting really had good timing to kind of take the place of that, and we're glad to have John on the line. So uh, without any further ado, John has a great presentation lined up to talk about his style of trading and also to discuss the squeeze indicator, which is a very popular indicator available uh, on, on several different platforms. Um, some are licensed to platforms that you may have access to or they are available for uh, purchase in other places. So John's here. John, go ahead. And uh, start with your presentation, and I'll let you know if I see any questions come in through the chat. 
Okay, sounds good. Well, um, thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. And uh, Seth, also, it's uh, just kind of cool getting to know kind of what the firm does and everything like that. Awesome day on Monday. This is, uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head. This is the kind of week that traders live for. And it's interesting talking about, you know, we have, uh, you know, we focus on options and we definitely, you know, focus on selling premium and income. But at heart, I was trained as a directional trader. So, um, I do like to, you know, buy calls and buy puts and buy futures and, and different things like that too. And and what I'm going to be talking about with the squeeze is essentially once you understand a technical setup, then you can, the more knowledge you have about how the markets work, the more you can do with it. For example, with a bullish setup, you could buy an in the money call or you could sell an at the money put spread, right? And there's different things you can do and there's different things that I think are more appropriate in different markets. This kind of market is directional. Um, here, just real quick, I just, I always like to show like, Hey, you know, do you really trade all that kind of stuff? This is uh, my account that I set up at the beginning of the year, 150 grand. Uh, you can see right now, P and L, uh, about a little over half a million dollars. So a couple hundred percent. I know people that are doing a lot better this year. I know other people that aren't, but just showing that, Hey, these are, I really do trade. This is what I do. Um, I like it and et cetera, et cetera. So um all right so let's do that and so what i want to just talk about is kind of the squeeze and just a few basic tenets of my philosophy of trading and we'll look at that all right so the idea with this of course is this is a disclaimer you can read it when i sh when i show my PL, I always say, look, that's what I've done. It does not mean in any way, shape, or form that that's something that you can do. Um, it does not mean in any way, shape, or form that it's easy. And trading is risky. You could end up blowing out all your capital. Okay, so just you know, that's just that's just trading, and that's that's why trading is so challenging and so attractive to a lot of people because every day you're not only going up against the markets and you're going up against yourself. Okay. All right. Part one. So what I want to do is I'm going to spend a few slides here just talking about trading meets reality. Okay. And then we're going to talk, go into a setup. One of the things that I've learned um, over the years in trading is that I can show people a perfect setup, but if their mindset is wrong, they're going to screw it up. Okay. You know, not taking profits when they should, adding to losers, all that kind of stuff that the markets are really, really good at tricking people into doing. All right. At the end of the day, you want your trading to be like the odds portion of the no pass line bet in craps where probabilities are in your favor. If you're not familiar with craps, it's a game that I like to play if I'm in Vegas, uh, but the no pass line is an unpopular bet, yet it's the highest probability bet, okay? And there's a lot of other fancy bets on the craps table that once you're educated in the game of craps, you just stop doing because they're over time, they're gonna kill you. And it's the same way in trading. There's a lot of different trades that you can do, okay? But if you learn to avoid the ones that are the lower probability setups, you're gonna save a lot of money and you're gonna save a lot of anguish. So the reality of trading is that the market ebbs the markets and the odds ebb and flow. And I think it's important to realize that the movements in the market can be random. Monday was a great example. Um, on Friday, I was bearish, but I had no idea that there was going to be a mini flash crash on Monday. I mean, I was glad it helped my positions a lot, but you know, it's, we don't, nobody can plan for that kind of stuff, but you can put the odds in your favor. But that being said, there were technical setups pretty much screaming that you should not be long. Okay. And you should in fact be short, which we'll talk about, but you can put the odds in your favor with both a technical and a mental edge. And even with a technical edge, the markets will throw you a curveball once in a while, and it's always when you least expect it, okay? And even with a mental edge, that edge is not permanent. It is something that needs constant vigilance or it will become dull. The worst thing you can do as a trader is assume you know everything in the markets, is to wake up cocky and confident that, you know, you, got, you, you know what to do. And that's typically the time when, because of your mindset, the market throws you a curveball and you don't know how to handle it and you get run over. Okay, it's important. You got to, on each and every trade, you got to act like you're a professional trader. So, and oftentimes 
you've got to figure all this out while having interruptions while trying to trade. Okay, this is called real life. Now, I trade. I've got an office, but there's sometimes when I'm trading on my iPad, I've got three young kids. Sometimes they want to see what I'm doing. And the reality of it is I've got to be focused. If I've got positions, um, you know, I don't want to scream at my kids and say, get away from me, I'm trading, right? Because it's like, you know, I don't want to send them to go see a psychologist when they're 25. It's, but that's just, you know, you got to kind of man up or woman up and deal with the distractions in your life while this stuff is going on. Um, so the human brain versus trading. So I got a couple more slides on this and then we're gonna dive into the setups. So what I what I've found in trading, and I've been doing this for like 25 years, is every day you gotta strike a balance between controlling your fear and believing your own BS. Uh, in reality, trading is a daily battle between two enemies. And I would say it's yourself and for lack of a better term, hedge funds and high frequency traders, okay? There's all that stuff that's going on out there. I actually am completely fine with high frequency traders. Once you know how the game is played, um, you can play the game to win. So, I, you know, anybody who's blaming high frequency traders for their losses just doesn't understand how the game. But mostly you got to stay in touch with yourself. If you are a discretionary trader, if your head isn't screwed on right, um, you are just opening yourself up to attack. Um, okay, so the key is, you know, you got to kind of know what your brain should look like while you are in a trade. And thinking well means pushing against the grain of our nature, against vanity, laziness, against the desire for certainty, okay? This is the biggest disaster any trader can have is a desire for certainty. But I just want to know what's going to happen next. Really? In the markets, you want to know what's going to happen next. And the key in trading is to figure out a way to be confident in a situation where you never know what's going to happen next, okay? Which is kind of interesting. So... And it's just having the ability to go against our lesser impulses, greed, fear, et cetera, for the sake of our higher ones. So this is a sign that I have hung up on my computer it's from Mark Douglas. If you guys haven't read Trading in the Zone and you're a discretionary trader, I can't imagine not uh, trading without having read that book. So the idea with this is that before you take a trade, I like to read this checklist and make sure that I've got my head screwed on straight, okay? So, Anything can happen. To, to succeed in trading, you've got to have a probabilistic mindset. So what is a probabilistic mindset? Anything can happen. You need to know with 100% certainty that anything can happen, okay? That means that even if everything look like, looks like it's gonna go higher, it could turn around and go lower in a big way. Secondly, you do not need to know what is going to happen next in order to make money. Third, there is a random distribution between wins and losses for any given set of variables that define an edge. So what does that mean? Let's say you've got a setup that has a 75% win ratio, okay, and you do 100 trades. Well, in a perfect world, you would win three times out of four, right? But you could have eight trades in a row that lose money, and they would still fall on this within 100 trades. So you've just got to realize that. You never, you know, it's not, if, if you have a 75% probability of a trade working out, it doesn't mean that you're only going to have one loser out of every four trades, right? And an edge is nothing more than an indication of a higher probability of one thing happening over another. And finally, every moment in the market is unique. So I like to look at that. And if you have that mindset, you'll focus on the risk. And then you'll do something where instead of um, eating like an elephant, instead of eating like a bird and crapping like an elephant, you'll eat like an elephant, crap like a bird. That means that you want your. John, I think your sound is cutting in and out. If anybody else has that experience, chat in. But or it could just be. Oh, is it cutting out a little bit? Okay, let me uh, little, let me yeah, make sure. A couple times. Let me make sure that my mic here is good to go. All right, sounds good. Um, Sorry about that. Is it good? Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about squeezes as a technical setup, and then I want to go and look at some at the current markets real quick too. Okay. All right, so the squeeze, this is a popular indicator. It's been out uh, now for a while. Um, I wrote about it in my book, Mastering the Trade, which came out 10 years ago. I can't believe it came out 10 years ago. And uh, this is my favorite indicator for timing a trend, whether it's a one-day trend or a multi-month trend. Okay, the beauty of this thing is that you can kind of fit it to your nature. If you're a scalper, great. Use it on a one and a five-minute chart. If you're a swing trader, you know, use it on an hourly and a daily chart. If you're a position trader, weekly and monthly chart, okay? It's just, it doesn't matter. You can match it with your time frame. 
And it's a setup that I kind of tweak and refine as the markets change, but it continues to be great and reliable in whatever market, whether it's a slow trending market that we've had for a while, um, whether it's a market like this where it's just insane. Um, and so these are just kind of the latest ways and how, how I use this. Now, let's just talk about what this is, okay? The first of all, I have found that this trade has does have a success rate of about 75%. Um, and uh, what's nice about it is that while an average move is nice, sometimes they lead to greater than average moves. One of the things I love about the squeeze when it comes to options is that while there's a 75% success rate, the odds of creating a greater, and if you're an option trader, you're going to know what this means, greater than expected move, okay, are high. Um, what this means is that if you guys know, if you like say, even like with, a, with a weekly option, say on Tesla, may have an expected move for the rest of the week of 10 bucks, okay? And what that means is that the options are priced for a $10 move. But if a squeeze sets up and you have a potential for a greater than expected move, like, okay, the odds are, you know, even though, you know, 68% of the time it's going to stay within this, if there's a squeeze, that actually increases, okay? There, it's actually no longer a 68% chance that it's going to stay within that expected move. It actually increases. And that means those are, and those are, those are times when you can buy, I know this is like a cardinal sin, but you could buy an out of the money option during that time and risk a little bit and potentially um, have a nice move. And of course you could buy in the money options, you could sell puts, yada, yada, yada. But it's an important part of trading options. So how markets move, 80% of the time, uh, they just aren't doing much. They're consolidating. Uh, they're chopping back and forth, and they're building up energy for the next move, okay? And in general, buying out of the money options is one of the best ways to lose money trading, okay? I love to sell like Delta 20 options out of the money because 80% of the time, those things are going to expire worthless, whether they're calls or whether they're puts. But 20% of the time, the markets are going to experience a momentum type move, okay, that actually is a greater than expected move and sometimes turns into a two standard deviation move. And that's when I can buy directional options. That's when I switch from being an income trader to a directional trader and I'm willing to buy calls. I, if I'm going to buy a call or a put, I'm typically going in the money, okay, Delta 70. Uh, that way there's not a lot of premium decay. But I don't do it as a spread because I don't want to cap the gains because with the squeeze, you're having, you have the potential for a greater than expected move, right? Okay, so, so what is the squeeze? So first, let's just talk about the mechanics of it so we can be on the same page and understand. Here's a daily chart of the S&Ps, okay? So I'm gonna show you this as an example, and then what I wanna do is after we go through a couple of examples, I actually wanna look at the current markets and just show you what was setting up last week and what's setting up now. So if you look at this chart, um, here's the here's the S&P, here's the, here's the spiders, right? And we've been trading sideways here for a while, and when you're trading sideways, we all know that after a consolidation, you're looking for either a break to the upside or a break to the downside. And, and common wisdom is, well, wait for the break to the outside and then go with it, or wait for the break to the downside and go with it. And what I like is the idea of what if there was a way to get an edge that says, hey, this thing is getting so quiet, we know one, when it's about to break one way or the other, and two, we have a probability of 75% that we know if it's gonna be up to the upside or to the downside suddenly it gets interesting because we can take positions in here when the market is quiet, right? And when you're trading options and the market is quiet, that's when the implied volatility goes down and that's the best time to buy options, okay? And then guess what? When it moves, not only do you get price movement in your favor, but the IV, the implied volatility also starts to increase. So you get a double bang for your buck, okay? So, and, and that to me is about the only time that it makes sense to buy options. Every other time I'm selling options, but if you can get the timing down right, it makes sense to buy. As you know, when you're selling premium, you're, you've got higher probability, but you've got limited gains, where if you buy an option, you know, your, your gains are theoretically unlimited, right? But you, know, you, you might be looking at a five bagger or a double or a triple or something like that. Okay, so the first tool that we are looking at is the Bollinger Bands, okay? So none of this is rocket science. This is all stuff that's been around for a while. It's just kind of a different way to look at all of them together. Bollinger Bands measure 
what's called standard deviation. Okay, and typically they're set, I set up at two standard deviation. Okay, so as the market, uh, as the market is moving, the bands expand as the range of two standard deviations increases. As the market consolidates and the price fluctuations narrow, the Bollinger Bands contract as the two standard deviation range uh, contracts, right? So simple enough. So one of the things that I noticed was that once the bands kind of started trading horizontal, you know, a lot of times that meant that the price action, if they're narrow and horizontal, that the price action was about to move again. But the question always came up is how narrow is narrow, right? What do you, what do, when I say narrow, what specifically do I mean? Because I don't want to like, you know, rely on my eyesight on, on something like this. So the next part of this, the next tool is called the Keltner channels. Keltner channels, I set at 20 and 1.5. And Keltner channels measure what's called the average true range, or ATR for short. So all I'm looking for are moments in time when the standard deviation of the Bollinger Bands is trading inside of the average true range. Okay, to me, that is a price and volatility squeeze. And once it is squeezed, it's got to be released. It's like building up energy. And it, this, these are the points when typically you're going to see the Bollinger Bands expand again, which means that the price is going to go, right? All right. So from there, then the question is, all right, so you've got a situation where um, you've got a squeeze, but how do you get an edge if it's going to go higher or lower once the energy is released? And from there, we just add a 12-period momentum oscillator, all right? So in this case, when you see that the Bollinger Bands are inside the Keltner channels, you can go look at the momentum. And if during this time, while it's trading sideways, you can see momentum trending higher, 75% probability that when price action here moves, it's going to be to the upside and, of course, vice versa. All right? Um, now, so the indicator now, uh, for a while, that's what I, all I did is I looked at those charts. And... So I would just look at this, but it just got to be a little clunky. So we just kind of put all that into an indicator that's called the squeeze. And all this is, is that, so when you see red dots, the red dots are just the indication that the Bollinger Bands are inside the Keltner channel, okay? And the first green dot after the red dots is an indication that the Bollinger Bands have popped back outside of the, uh, 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 <laughs> popped back outside of the, of the uh, Bollinger Bands. Uh, that the Bollinger Bands have popped back outside the Keltner channels. It's been a you know another crazy trading day, right? Long long day. Mm -hmm. um, so so technically this is the signal to get in. Okay, so if you see this red dots, and then at the first green dot, if the histogram is above zero, it's a long, and if the histogram is below zero, it's a red. Now I've been doing this long enough where I like to sneak into these things. Um, and I'll show a couple of tools that I use for that. But I like to sneak into them early while it's super quiet and I can accumulate options, long options, for the cheapest price as possible. Okay? So here's what I do is that if the stock, and by the way, the squeeze is not, um, it, it's really, it's kind of a trend, in, a trend continuation tool. So here, the S&Ps were trending higher. We've got a squeeze. Once the momentum shifts back in the direction of the trend, at that moment in time, I take a full position, okay? And at this point, I'm anticipating that it's gonna fire long, and in this case, it does, and you can stay in the trade as long as the momentum is making higher highs every day. The average squeeze lasts eight to 10 bars, okay? So on a daily, that means eight to 10 days. You don't have to stay in it all eight to 10 days. I typically like to take off half after about four bars. That's when you get your initial pop and then you go sideways again. Um, so if you're a scalper, you can look at a one minute chart and your average trade is gonna last eight to 10 minutes, right? Eight to 10 bars. A weekly squeeze is going to be eight to 10 weeks and so on and so on. So you can kind of just match it to your to whatever time frame you like to trade. Um, I like to see, one of the things I like here is that if there is a squeeze that has fired on a weekly chart, well, guess what? For the next eight to 10 weeks, 
on all other time frames, I'm buying pullbacks because on a weekly chart, we've got momentum to the upside, right? In that particular example. Um, and we already talked about that, that it, the average one typically lasts eight to 10 bars, right? So what I wanna do real quick is let's just kind of look at the current markets and I'm gonna, I'll adjust these. Let's, uh, let me look at the S, I'll look at the S&Ps here first. And I've got a lot of things going on here, but I just want to show you two main charts uh, that I like to look at here. So when we walked into um, Thursday and Friday and Saturday, uh, take a look at the daily and weekly charts here on the S&Ps. So we're sitting here going like, all right, here we are. Um, we're consolidating, right? We've got kind of a sloppy head and shoulders top here. And we've got a squeeze forming on the daily and the weekly chart. There is no reason to be long in this market. And the momentum's below zero, right? And so on Friday, we started loading up uh, short on shorts. Let's buy puts on you know, Google, buy puts on Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I had no idea that the market was going to do this. But based on basic things that I've seen in the past, it would make sense that the S&Ps would have gone to about 2013, OK? So what's nice about this is that you may not know exactly what's going to happen here, but you have an idea of what could happen. And typically when you see a squeeze like this, it's going to drive it down to the last support level and potentially through. Remember, it's set up to have a greater than expected move. In this case, it was just a bonus because it's like this thing just got trashed. Now, as you're watching this and you're trying to scalp this, you're trying to day trade it or whatever, then you can drop down to like say a 15 minute chart you know whatever you want and so today you know now by the way if i'm looking at the s p's you can trade it with the spiders right you can buy calls on the spiders um, but as we're trending up today and going like all right when gosh when can i get in this move i'm missing this move oh great here's a squeeze the momentum's above zero i can buy some futures here or i can buy some calls on the spiders and this is good for 20 points in the s p's which is two points in the spiders all right now, of course, at the same time, you could, if you trade Netflix, guess what? If the stock market's gonna go higher, Netflix is probably gonna go higher. And if you look at something like Netflix, it's also going to have its own setups. Um, one of the stocks that we traded today into the close um, was Tesla. And you can see here that we had five minute squeezes here that we're setting up. And again, did not know that this thing was going to, you know, gap up and all these crazy things and, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, again, the nice thing about this is that whatever market you're looking at, whatever, uh, you know, whatever thing is setting up, it's going to give you moments in time that provide a higher probability setup. Okay. Um, and I want to show, what was the one here from yesterday? Nice one on the NASDAQ. Oh, so look at this, this was beautiful. So this was on, I mean, my days of the week now are just kind of confused, but so we're looking at the NASDAQ. And again, if I see the NASDAQ futures here, and here we are, we're setting up, here's a squeeze. Well, what's the squeeze doing? Okay, we got momentum, we got momentum, and it triggers short right here. Plenty of time to get in on this trade, right? And you can buy puts on the queues, you can buy puts on your favorite stock, and you stay short until the momentum shifts. If you get two bars in a row, the opposing color, then you get out, okay? So that's a nice, in this kind of a market, I mean, you know, 50 points on the NASDAQ, that, that equates to nice points on the Qs, nice points on, you know, Netflix, on Tesla, whatever. So this is the kind of stuff that to me, it helps you pick your battles. It helps you pick the moments in time where you're gonna have a higher probability of uh, success instead of going like wow this is just going to keep going higher right um so so that's so that's been something that, that i like a lot um even other markets let's look here at oh let's look at apple and the other thing here too of course is so goes if i can type in the symbol right so goes apple so goes the market right well guess what apple fired off a weekly squeeze to the downside 
three weeks ago, okay, when it was here at about $120. There's been no reason to be long Apple, and guess what? This is eight to 10 weeks of selling. So not only was it a bonus because this thing fell so much, but you know, once you take profits, guess what? You get another drink at the well when it rallies back to resistance. So if we come back to like the eight uh, period moving average, I'm gonna load up on puts again. But that initial move is what we're looking for. And by the way, so goes Apple, so goes the market, right? So it's, it's hard to be bullish on the market when one of the largest stocks on the planet has these weekly uh, sell signals. All right, so let's come back here and look at this. All right, so squeezes may or may not result in an explosive move. It could be a normal move. And by the way, there's a 25% chance it would fail, right? There's no guarantees in trading. But remember, with buying options, premium decay is our enemy. So if a squeeze fires long, right? So if a squeeze fires long, we know there's a 75% chance it's gonna rally, right? But instead of buying calls, we could sell at the money puts or even slightly in the money puts. And now suddenly our odds of success have increased because it, typically if it fails, it fails sideways, meaning it just doesn't get any momentum. Well, if you sold at the money puts, you're still gonna make money in the premium decay. So depending on your own trading goals and if you're looking for income or you're more conservative, et cetera, et cetera, that's the kind of stuff to look at. Oh, and by the way, I know a lot of people like to sell like iron condors and straddles and stuff like that. And um, this is this one thing will save you more angst than I think about anything I can tell you in terms of that kind of stuff. But if we look here at, I mean, we can pick a stock. So, so here's Tesla. Tesla, great premium. You know, you can sell sell calls and sell puts, or maybe, you know, one, maybe two standard deviations out, and you just collect that premium. Well, guess what? If a squeeze fires, I am not going to sell an iron condor. I'll sell puts, but I'm not going to sell any calls because I'm expecting a greater than expected move. But one of the best times to sell iron condors is after a squeeze is over. Once that happens, you typically are going to trade sideways for eight to 10 bars. Okay. So, and what's nice is that because you just had a big move, you are typically going to have some pretty decent implied volatility and to take advantage of. So it's it's actually, even though the squeeze is a directional indicator, I actually use it to time selling premium as well. All right. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. And da, 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 da. okay, that's that's fine. We'll talk about that. Okay, here we go. So the, the next question that people always ask is what about a target? Um, and I, I'm a big believer in taking some money off the table as the market you know, gives you the opportunity to do so, but at the same time, kind of leaving a runner. So one of my favorite, very simple tools is something like this. This to me is kind of a classic squeeze. So here, you know, whatever, we got a gap up or whatever it is. And here we've got this nice consolidation. We get a squeeze. All right, so great, I'm gonna buy some calls, I'm gonna sell some puts, but when do I get out? And I'm a big believer in just very simple tools and I like Fibonacci's. So I'm a big believer in the 1272 extension uh, for targets, if you don't know what that is. Uh, and again, this is for directional, right? Because if you saw this signal and you sold, you sold a one standard deviation, put credit spread here, then you're not worried about this. Great, just let it expire worthless, right? But if you did a directional play, you have got to take advantage of the momentum. So all the 1272 extension is, is um, I mean, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with it, but even if, you know, if there's one person who's not, I can tell you in like two seconds here. So when you get the signal, okay, you're gonna go back and you're gonna look at the highest high. So in this case, that's right there. And then you're gonna look this way for the lowest low. It's like, oh, it's right there. And then you're just gonna draw all your fibs and that's the 1272 extension. And that's just 27% of this move. And if a stock breaks out to a new high, whether it's a 20 bar high or a yearly high, you've got about a 90% chance that it's gonna hit that 1272 extension and about a 60% chance that'll hit the 1618. So here I'm definitely taking off like half 
of my directional options, moving up a stop loss to break even on the trade, and then seeing if we can get to the 1618. But if I sold a put credit spread, I don't care. I'm just going to let it expire worthless or buy it back at 80% of max profit or whatever. But with directional trades, you got to, you know, you got to take action. Okay. Um, and then for, if you guys are into price patterns, I, I do like cup and handles. So if it happens to be that there's a, a cup and handle that, that lines up with the squeeze, that's even better. Okay. And, and that's something that I like uh, quite a bit. All right. All right. So, so I've just gone through a lot. It's pretty straightforward, I think, but I want to check, I can check in here and see if there's any questions. Yeah, I'm going to toss um, one out there that, that sure. I got via email before uh, even we started, and that is you're using TradeStation, and I, I use TradeStation as well, and I've done a lot of backtesting. There's a lot of people in our community that have written uh, custom code and had it either for automation um, or just at least for backtesting to, to get those statistics. Uh, have you had the squeeze indicator converted into something that can be automated or back tested and you know I'll just we'll start with that is that is that anything you've worked on sure no I had I, I do work with a gentleman named John Clayberg if, if you guys have heard of him but he he has turned it into a system um, I I have found that with a system you have to be a little stricter with it I like to narrow it down to about 20 stocks you know like the apples the Googles and stuff like that too and I like to have, um, you know, just make sure that something simple like, you know, the 8, the 21, 34, uh, you know, 55 and 89 period moving averages are all stacked on top of each other and price is at least above the 21. So if you've got a few basic things like that, then it kind of turns into a nice, nice little system like that. The problem I found with TradeStation is that it's going to give you, like if we're looking at the chart here, like it's not going to give you an entry until the signal bar fires and that bar closes. So typically, in my opinion, you get it, you end up getting the signal late. I actually like to look at it and try to, you know, ease into it early. Uh, so that's that's the only thing that I've found is that you know I haven't I've, there's some there's some ways of course you can tweak it to try to get in early, but I've found that that's kind of the discretionary eye helps there. Okay, so it can be automated, but it lowers the probability or at least lowers the risk, the re the return on risk because of yes, the late yeah, entry, I, I, waiting for confirmation. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I, the biggest thing I've found is it just, it just gets you in late. All right, great. So can you read the chat? Do you want to scroll through or do you want me to pick any? Uh, I can see, let's see, I can see, I see, I can start at the bottom here. I can see um, under which conditions would you adjust the standard settings of the squeeze indicator? So I actually never have. Um, I have played around with it. And sometimes I will change, just kind of change things around to see what they are, but I have not seen it um, provide an improvement, an improvement that I was looking for. Um, for example, if you reduce the, you know, Bollinger Bands from, or the, uh, the moving average from like down to 15 from 20, you're going to get faster signals, but I've just found they're not as quality. So I, I've actually played around with it a little bit, but I've kept, you know, I've pretty much used these settings, the same settings forever. Um, can you use it for equities? Absolutely. Um, I, so I specifically use it for equities and futures and, you know, Forex, you can use it for Forex too. Um, what I do is I get a signal on the stock. Oh, here, let me show you. I'll show you an example of one today that we bought today. Um, so if you look at SCMP, here's a stock today. It's like, wow, this thing is making, you know, new all-time highs. Well, guess what? There's a daily squeeze setting up. So, you know, I bought some of the stock today because I like stocks that are making new all-time highs uh, for a couple of different reasons. But now that there's a squeeze, you know, remember, we're looking at, you know, eight to 10 bars, eight to 10 days of generally higher prices. So that's one I bought today. And I, you know, I wish I would have bought it down here, but I did not. But um, you could absolutely use it on equities, and I, I look at it, if you guys use radar, uh, TradeStation, I mean, I just set it up where on radar screen, so I can just sit there and say, okay, on daily charts, you know, which, which one of these have squeezes, and you can come up here and just say, okay, right now, and of course, there's not a lot of squeezes because it's been so volatile, but you can see like, wow, the bond, the 30-year bonds, uh, SCMP, we already saw that one, that's how I found that one earlier. Um, and you can change the time frame and and so but yeah I absolutely use those on equities 
and let's see. I just lost the other oh, the questions. I was going to say I just lost the questions. Um, and I use yes. Is the squeeze from Toss the real thing? Yes, it is. So, so I use TradeStation and Toss, and the and Toss licensed the study. So that is that is the. I, so I, I use both. I um, I've used TradeStation for so long, and I really like the radar screen. Um, but I like executing. Um, if I'm selling premium, Toss is just really good for doing that. Uh, directional trades. I don't. You know. I don't. I don't care if it's TradeStation or Toss. Yeah, I'll discuss Waves. We'll talk about that real quick. Is it available on MT4? I actually don't know. I can I can check on that. Um, ba, 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 ba. And okay, so any idea on how the odds would compare in buying a call vertical and selling a put vertical? So in my opinion, if you've got a bullish trade and you're going to decide whether to you know, buy a call vertical or sell a put vertical, I think the higher probability is selling the put vertical. Because if you're selling the put vertical, um, the stock could essentially trade sideways and you could still get max profit. If you buy a call vertical, it could trade sideways and you won't lose a lot, but you're not going to get max profit. So if that makes sense. All right. Yeah, so any thoughts on the weekly squeeze that just fired off on the SPX? So, so here's what's interesting here. Look what's happened here on the S&Ps. Um, now, we've had a crazy rally here, but because the squeeze has fired off, guess what? I'm, gonna, I'm looking to short this rally, and I'm looking for a retest of the lows. Now, there were some special circumstances here, you know, mini flash crash and all that, so maybe we won't get all the way back down there. But to me, as long as the momentum is going down, right, you've got eight to 10 weeks of potential selling. Now, doesn't mean we're not gonna get fierce rallies, it just means when we get to resistance levels and stuff like that, I wanna be a seller. And oh, for crude oil, yeah, and, for, and by the way, it, you know, when I look at say crude oil futures, you can do these trades on USO. So, for example, one of the trades that we did here is look at the squeeze that set up on crude oil when it was at $60. Well, we shorted some crude oil futures, but guess what? We could buy a lot of puts on USO here, too. Very, very clean uh, setup to the downside. If you don't use Toss or TradeStation, is your scanner effective to pick squeezes up? Yeah, so one of the things we did is because, I mean, we use Toss and TradeStation, but I know that not everybody does. So we did create kind of a cheap web-based scanner um, that you can, you know, actually, you know, it'll, it'll find these things. So it doesn't matter what, you know, the platform and stuff like that that you're using. How do you get 8 to 10 bars? Experience or backtesting? A little bit of both. Um, that's just, I've just found is the average. Uh, well, let's do this. So one of the things that people, someone just asked about was the waves. So let's look at that real quick. And I talked earlier about how do you get into this stuff early. And so one of the tools, or one of my favorite tools uh, for doing that is just called the waves. And it's just a way, let's see here. So all the waves are, is a simple way to kind of look at what's going on in the mar in the, whatever market and whatever time frame you're looking at. Okay, so there's a C wave, there's a B wave, and then there's an A wave. Okay, all this does it's very simple. The A wave measures the short-term trend of whatever market on whatever time frame you're looking at. The B wave measures the intermediate term trend, whatever market, whatever time frame you're looking at, and the C wave measures the long-term trend. So if we're looking at weekly oil, long-term trend clearly down, intermediate term trend down, A wave is not as important, okay? So why, why is this important? Well, when a squeeze is setting up, what I like to do is go and look at the waves. Oh, the C wave is below zero, long-term trend is down, okay? Now the B wave is above zero, so it's a mixed message here, right? And then the A wave is blah. So it's kind of a mixed message. And in this case, what I would do is I'd wait for it to trigger, it triggers and I can get short. Now, 
That being said, there are times when everything is completely in alignment where it makes absolute sense to start getting into a position the moment you see it, the squeeze develop. An example of this would be SCMP, okay? So SCMP, I'm, I'm going through it and I, like, I go, wow, I, I see a squeeze setting up. C wave above zero, B wave above zero, A wave above zero. So when I see something like this that is this obvious, like it's like, oh my gosh, the long-term, intermediate term, and short-term trend is above zero, we're in a squeeze, the odds of this continuing to go higher are, it's, I mean, it's close to 90%, okay? Now, of course, this could be the, the top of the move, but what we're talking about here is odds. And when you see something like this, you know, a trend is your friend until it ends. You know, trying to guess exactly when a trend is going to end is, is futile. Um, and on something like this, we can see it across all, you know, across all time frames. If we look at something, you know, like Walmart, uh, this, where was the last squeeze on this? Yeah, so Walmart here, this is one where, okay, oh gosh, here's a squeeze. I mean, gosh, the stock's already getting hammered, but guess what? The C wave is below zero, the B wave is below zero. As long as these two are below zero, then that to me is something that you start getting in now. You can sell call credit spreads, you can buy put debit spreads, you can buy puts, okay? The point is that we're looking for, in my opinion, eight to 10 bars on average of a down move. And does that make sense? So the, the main thing with the waves is that I, I'm, when I'm looking at a squeeze, I'm like, all right, can I get into this thing early, yes or no? And if I can't, I wait for it to, I wait for the squeeze to fire. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Having the dominant trend, if it's clear, it increases the probability. So that that's very, Yep. Cool. Um, let's see. I was trying to think of another. Are, are there any uh, stocks or anything like that that you guys would like me to look at? Uh, one in recent memory that was insane was AMBA. So here was, if you guys remember, so you had this nice consolidation. And by the way, I love it when there's a squeeze when a stock is near the highs and it has high short interest. I think at this point, AMBA had like 25% short interest or something crazy. Uh, it just means that you can get an exaggerated move. And here you can see like, okay, C waves above zero, B waves above zero. Um, you know, and this thing was just insane. And it was just a short covering nightmare. And on something like this, now obviously this thing ended in tears, but you know, you just kind of take profits as you, as you go. And um, so that was that was you know, and that was a fun one. You never know when you're going to get a move like that. But what's nice about it is that sometimes those kind of moves happen, and that's what I mean by um, you can get sometimes two standard deviation moves where that's the only time it makes sense to buy like out of the money calls, right? And of course you can buy in the money calls too. Uh, Google. A couple, a couple more stocks came in, yeah. And then yeah, I so, like the, I like this question that came too about. Diagonally, the diagonalizing, but that also brings in to mind um, just a little bit more clarity on the types of options. So you say puts, but then um, uh, which delta, which how much time to expiration based on what uh, time frame chart mm -hmm. you're looking at, things like that. Okay, sure, that's a good question. So let's look at AutoZone because this is one that we did recently. So here's AutoZone. Of course, this is a crazy stock. The spreads are wide. The option spreads are like three bucks, right? And there's no volume. And by the way, that doesn't bother me. Um, I know any books you read on options trade are going to say, you know, stick to the, you know, stick to Apple. Well, guess what? Everybody's trading Apple. And what I've found is that if you're on the right side of a trade, illiquidity can be your best friend. So I do actually seek out these kind of trades. So here we got AutoZone. Here's a squeeze. You know, C wave obviously up, eh, B wave here is down on the daily, but look at the weekly chart, up, up, up. Okay, so the weekly trend is up and there's a squeeze. So on something like this, we'll typically do a call debit spread. Okay, so because the option prices are so ridiculous. So you might be, you know, and so when I do a debit spread, what I like to do is typically like a Delta, I'll buy a Delta 65 option and then I'll sell a Delta 25 option. Okay, give or take. And that to me is a nice kind of a mix, you know, a, nice, a decent risk to reward ratio. It's typically a one to one risk reward ratio. Um, and, but that's typically what I'll do if I'm going to do um, a debit spread. 
And if I'm going to sell in something like this, if I'm selling a put credit spread, I typically will do at the money. So that means I'm selling a delta 50. Okay. Um, and then if I'm going to, in terms of buying something for protection, that's more of a risk reward scenario, but I'll typically, you know, on, on AutoZone, you got to go, it's a $10 spread. It's a $10 strike. Um, but it, I'll just kind of go, uh, it, it just kind of pick the next strike down. I typically like to do $10 spreads. So it's not as critical. The main thing is, you know, you're selling that at the money option. And then from there, you just got to decide how much risk you're willing to take. Uh, I don't do calendars. So I, I've got, a, there's a guy in the office here. He loves calendars. He does them. Uh, for me, I just, my style is a little bit more directional. Uh, so I don't do calendars, but I do diagonals where I love the idea on something like this, where let's say there's a weekly squeeze, then I'll buy I'm going to buy an option. Oh, one of the questions I didn't ask, I didn't answer was, exp you know, how much time to, um, mm, right. how much time to hold. So this is a really good question. And I generally favor shorter term options, but here's a caveat. If a, well, okay, first let's look at this weekly. Here's a weekly chart right here, right? So let me get rid of all this drawings. So if I'm looking at something like a weekly squeeze and going like, wow, AutoZone here is at $550. There's a weekly squeeze. That means eight to 10 weeks of higher prices. And this thing could go crazy. Then I don't want to buy a monthly option, right? I want to buy, if, if this signal could last eight to 10 weeks, then, you know, I got to get something that's going to last like, you know, 55 to 70 days. So on something like this, then if I'm going to buy an option, I'll go like 70 days out. Now, I may end up doing a diagonal, right? So I'm buying an option 70 days out, but I may sell the next month's option against it in a perfect world. And I, and I, and I kind of go like Delta 20. So in a perfect world, what happens is you own this option, you collect rent on it by selling Delta 20s, right? And hopefully they expire worthless because I want to keep this. Um, and then you do it again the next month. Okay, and that's fine. If we're going to daily, then we've got eight to 10 days, right? So um, that's cutting a little close because if you're getting in right here, you don't know exactly when it's gonna go. So if there's a daily squeeze, typically if I'm buying an option, I like to go 15 to 30 days out if I'm buying an option. If I'm selling an option, I'll go closer in. But if I'm buying an option, I wanna be able to own that option through the length of the move, okay? And so if you know we buy a weekly option here and it's got three days, we could miss out on a good chunk of the move. So that, that's kind of, so I kind of, I, uh, I choose my option length of time based on the time frame I'm looking at. If I'm looking at an hourly signal that fires off on a Tuesday, I could use a weekly option because I'm only really going to be in that trade for one or two days. If that'll make sense. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. And before, we got a couple more questions, but before we get even close to the end, I want to make sure we stop and don't skip this part. I, I want to recognize you and say, uh, thank you for presenting, and it's it's rare to see, and we're it's refreshing to see not only a great trader but also an excellent presenter, and um, all the work you've done to put in put together outstanding presentations that are very clear, and I truly believe will add value uh, to the people that watch it and apply some of these signals, uh, even if it's just filters for discretionary trading or or whatever they use for it. But the, it should have value to any type of trading. So I want to just quickly thank you for for doing this here and then um, the two questions came in a row that on stop losses so if you get a, a fake not a fake signal but a, a false signal and it quickly turns the other direction you are defining your risk in the fact that you're buying options um, but do you use any type of stop losses and I'll, I'll add on to that um, do you use it automated if it's a low liquidity stock are you concerned about that uh, would you just place the stop loss anyways okay First of all, Andrew, thank you for the kind words. I mean, it's, I, I, I love trading and it's, it's fun to actually be able to explain it. So I'm, I'm glad that it's, 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 what's interesting is even if you don't use any of the tools that I like, I, it's, it's, I always say, if you can find one thing that you can add to your own trading plan, you know, it's, 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 it's worthwhile. Um, okay. So for stops, stops with options is always kind of an interesting thing. Um, it depends on what you're trading. So, if we use an example like AutoZone, I, the safest way to do it is if you're buying an option, is be willing to risk 100% of the premium. Now, I know that that's not realistic all the time, but what I mean by that is that, you know, if you are willing to risk, say, 2% of your equity on a trade, then 
buy 2% of your equity's worth of options, okay? So if it goes to zero, it's not a disaster. It's just, you know, it's just your stop loss. Now that's not realistic all the time, but that's the ideal way to do it. Now I, I will actually trade some bigger size. Um, maybe I'll put, you know, say seven, eight percent of my account into one option trade, but I'm not willing to let that go to zero. Um, obviously, it's there's some things that could happen out of my control, but in general, um, you know, I'll look at, you know, I'll look at it that way. Um, so let's let's look at a specific example. I'm going to look at a stock that's a little bit more liquid here. So Netflix. Netflix, Netflix, where was I on this trade? So, okay, so, so this is a recent trade in Netflix and here's a squeeze. Okay, I was pretty bullish on this. I mean, Netflix was trading near its highs. I did a pretty big position. And let me bring up another chart here that doesn't have all the uh, other things on it. Netflix, and I'm gonna put the squeeze on. And there we go. Okay, so on something like this, now this this trade didn't really give me any heartache, but when I look at this and say, all right, great, I wanna buy this. Well, I start asking, one of the questions I ask myself is, well, what would have to happen for Netflix to the, for this trade to be a failure? And so a lot of times that's just kind of simple, you know, support and resistance. So I'll just kind of look at this and say, well, you know, I'll, I'll look at two levels here and just kind of say, if, if um, right about there, and it's kind of ballpark, but I'll look at this and say, okay, um, ideally, if I'm getting in here, ideally this low will hold, okay, but I don't want to put a tight stop on an option contract. And if we take out, you know, in this case, 87.64, then this trade's a failure, okay? So that's how I determine my position size. And I'll say like, okay, I'm buying, you know, 10 options or whatever it is. And then if this thing fires and all of a sudden, you know, we trade and we trade down on this level, I typically will just cut it loose. Um, I, at that point, I'm very, um, I'm very impatient with my stocks, meaning that if I'm in a trade and I'm expecting this to happen and it doesn't, I just get rid of it. And I just, I might even get back in the next day. And my attitude is re-entry is only a commission away. But this is where, you know, look at some basic support and resistance levels. Ask, your, ask yourself the question, okay, if price went below this level, at what price would this have to go below for this to be a failed trade? And that's typically a breach of like support. And that's how you determine your position size. So if that level is $8 away, then, you know, you may have to buy two contracts. But if that level is only $2 away, then maybe you could buy 10 contracts, right? So that's how I look at it. And for a spread, it's different. Typically for a spread, um, if it's an at-the-money spread, it's kind of a risk to premium. You know, just, you know, it's one-to-one, -one, so it doesn't really matter. And if it's a, an out-of-the-money spread, so say I sell a two-standard deviation spread, I have no intention of taking a full loss on that because you're risking like 15 to make one. So if you start getting to that point, you know, you either got to be aggressive about just cutting it loose. Um, typically, if it gets to, you know, probability, uh, probability, probability of touching jumps up to like 30%, you know, if, if you're nervous about it, that's a good idea just to kind of cut it loose. Or if you understand how to make adjustments, um, that would be a time to do it. But I, I think it's actually easiest to set up trades that aren't going to blow up in your face. I personally would rather sell, sell you know, get a bullish setup like this sell an at the money puts credit spread with a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio or even a slightly in the money. And now I don't have the blow up factor. And I think, you know, I've, I talked to a couple people that, you know, they had uh, spreads on the SPX on the put side and on Monday they just got hammered. I mean, you know, they lost like 12 months worth of profits and that's the thing that can happen. You know, 95% of the time it works great, but the other 5% can hurt. Right. And I, I really think it's, we got to clear, you know, emphasize the point there that it, if you have a tight support level identified and you can add more contracts because you have a tighter uh, risk identified, it doesn't mean there's there's a lot of discussion about you know whatever your risk is, multiply it by two or three, and that should be your target. But in this case, just because you're risking less doesn't mean you should try to make less. It it just means you're risking less and you can make more by taking that larger uh, size. Totally agreed. Yeah, totally agreed. It's I I'm a big uh, non-believer in oh you got to risk one to make one. It's just it's a it's kind of a 
you've got to understand how much of your account you're willing to risk and then the upside's an open target if it's a directional you know it's not obviously if you're doing spreads and things like that it is a little bit more defined all right great so john uh, uh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Just, just a real quick question. I, I, I bet you a lot of the folks here are wondering who are uh, options guys, um, and I'm hearing a echo from somewhere. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but anyway, uh, John, do you ever reverse uh, a neutral options spread when you are sensing there's going to be a big move? Uh, like, uh, in other words, instead of selling an iron condor, like you might want to do after. Um, uh, a squeeze is played out, as you were suggesting. What if you, at the time of the squeeze, flip it and buy the iron condor? Have you ever done anything like that? Uh, that's a good question. So I, not specifically with iron condors. One of the things I will do, though, is, you know, I'm a big fan of selling straddles, um, selling at the money straddles. But if there's a squeeze and I'm not clear if if it's going to go up or down, that's one of the few times I'll actually buy a straddle. Uh, again, look, you know, looking for that greater than expected move. So I, I guess it's probably the same thing, you know, looking at it from an iron condors per perspective. But I, uh, you know, if I, if over, um, you know, if there's a if there's a normal if there's a time over here, it's like okay, I'm gonna we had a big move, so I'm gonna sell some straddles here during this consolidation. But if there's a squeeze, then I would never sell a straddle. I'd be looking to potentially either you know buy a straddle because it's gonna have a big move one way or the other. And what do you do? Uh, does or at the time of a squeeze, have you noticed anything uh, as far as implied volatility? Does there tend to be an increase of implied volatility right around a squeeze or not? Yeah. So this is uh, this is even the part. One of the things I like about the squeeze, I'm going to try to. I think I've got a chart here that's got implied vol on it. Um, one of the things I like about the squeeze is, especially for beginning traders, it kind of gets you in. If you're buying options, it kind of gets you in at the right time in terms from an implied volatility basis. So if we look at, let me see if I can get all this on here. Um, one of the things I like to look at is the intraday is the put. So this is a put call ratio, but down here is the implied volatility, right? So let me put a squeeze on here. And so if we look at the time, um, typically, now this was right before earnings, so that was, um, we're going to see that, but typically what will happen is more something like this, and I guess this is kind of an extreme example, but typically when you get a squeeze, um, you know, it's because the price action is quiet, and you know, and that might be an earnings, that might be earnings related, so that might be a little skewed, but typically what I've found is, let me find uh, the recent one in Apple here, uh, weekly... Oops. So, you know, if you look here, like on the spiders, so, you know, here, and of course this is an extreme example, but here's the squeeze. Well, it's kind of quiet price action, so it's low of low IV, and then the price goes and explodes. Well, let's look, look at something more normal. So here's a squeeze, IV is kind of quiet, and then, you know, then it goes and IV increases. So what I like about this is that you're essentially with a squeeze, you are buying options when the IV is typically dipped down a little bit. And then with the release of the squeeze, IV increases. So you get kind of mm -hmm. a double bang for your buck there, getting uh, both right. intrinsic value and IV increase. Right, exactly. It seems like, uh, are there cases where there's a squeeze going on, but it's not clear what direction it's going to come out of the squeeze? Oh, absolutely. So here's a, if we go back and we look at the waves here, right? let's, um, I'll bring this up here. So it's nice. My favorite squeezes are when, you know, we were, when you're looking at something and like all the waves are lined up and it's like, okay, this is obviously like, if we go back to SM, uh, if I type that in right. So on something like this, it's kind of like, okay, you know, this is an uptrend. We're going to buy something here. So for something that's not as obvious, uh, let's look at I'm trying to think of a recent one here. Um, it might maybe it was even Baidu, but if you look at this, so here's Baidu. You've got a small squeeze. You've got you know a C wave here that's just like okay, what's that? You know, is that up or down? It's kind of mixed. Um, so mm -hmm. on something like that, that's where it makes sense to I think to like okay, I'm just going to buy a straddle here because I don't know if this is I. 
I think it's going to have a greater than expected move, but I have no idea if that's going to be higher or lower, and that would be a situation where I could just buy a straddle. Right. And I was going to say, straddle seems to be a really sensible idea in a situation like that. And now that you tell me IV is actually lower, you know, during that period, it seems like a terrific strategy. Yeah. And again, it's it's kind of like one of those things where it's nice because especially for like if you're newer to options and you don't understand like how IV impacts prices, well, if there's red dots, that just in, that indicates that this market is so quiet that the IV has just kind of naturally reeled itself in a little bit. And right. buy, buying straddles makes, not only are you buying a straddle when the implied volatility is low, you're also buying it at a point when, you know, the odds of it having a greater than expected move, you know, for the life of that option cycle is, is, is higher than normal. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Um, I'm just going to quickly, if it will, you can keep looking through the questions and, and while you look, if you see one you want to answer, I'll just um, say this real quick. Uh, if you're visiting us, this is the Options Tribe at SMBU. You can find us on OptionsTribe.com. Uh, there is a way to opt in and get free updates from us to attend live webinars for free. They are open to the public, and we invite you to join us. And then, John, if you see any questions in there, you can answer those as well. But also, feel free to give a plug for how people can get a hold of you and, and track you down. Sure. I'll look at um, I'll look at some questions here, and then. Uh, yeah, for the stuff that we do, uh, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. We've got, obviously, our website is simpleroptions.com. Um, I'm going to do a class coming up here on, gosh, what day is it here? I'll just type it in here. I'm going to do a class, I'm going to do a class next week on how to trade options on IDOs. Um, it's just like a little $97 class. If you're interested in that, you can go to simpler, uh, simpleroptions.com forward slash IPO. And that's IPO, options on IPOs are kind of fun simply because uh, if you guys don't know this, the bases in IPO typically produce bigger moves than any other base. So by the time a base forms on an IPO, um, if it's a popular stock, you're typically at that point gonna have options trading on it. And then there's a few tricks because also, because the implied volatility on those is pretty high. And then if you are interested, uh, just we, we do have a live trading room and different things like that too. Uh, you can go to simpleroptions.com forward slash, I think it's this, uh, but that would take you to a $7 trial to our uh, trading room. When we do a trading room where we're sharing charts, we have text alerts and just kind of, you know, this is what we're doing. And let me see here if there's any other questions that I might have missed. Um, okay, so for questions... I'd always heard that IV explodes more on downside moves than upside moves. Yes, you're right. Downside, downside is scary, and the more uncertainty there is in a market, then the higher the implied volatility goes. So we, we have like record implied volatility right now because of the big down moves. Um, Robin, for the stop loss above below green bar, I think I covered that already. Um, I just, you know, I just do it based on kind of support and resistance and position size correctly. Where do we download the indicator settings? Toss only has TTM trend, wave, squeeze, scalper alert, LRC. So on that, you would use the squeeze and the wave. The wave is essentially, what they did is they have the, like the A and the C wave combined. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Where, da -da -da -da, okay, got that. Does the toss have the same radar screen as trade station? They don't have it by default, although their scanner is pretty robust. Um, but we do have code that you can download from our site that kind of mimics the radar screen. Where can you learn more about squeezes? Uh, well, I kind of told you most of what you need to know. Um, I do have a book out called Mastering the Trade. Uh, it's on Amazon that does have some information on the squeezes. And, and we do some other classes and things like that, too, that go into it in more depth. Exactly. Take this. Mm -hmm. Mar the markets well, do take well the stairs up and the elevator down. All right. Looks like that's looks like that's all the questions. Yeah. There's there's a lot, but if, if you want to send those in, um, I'll just put my email address in here. And if I see uh, any questions, can't type and talk at the same time. Hold on. Uh, if I see 
some similar questions come across, I will try to send those over to John and, um, and then maybe post those out in a blog post, try to cover maybe a few questions in one shot. So we'll attempt to do that. So you can send me an email with that as well. All right, so we'll, uh -huh. we'll cut it off and respect everybody's time. Uh, thank you all for coming to this um, kind of different time options try meeting on a Thursday. Uh, we should be back. We actually are going to be back to regular schedule Tuesday, 5 p.m. Eastern, options tribe. You can go to optionstribe.com and click. you can click on join, and there's actually a free form you can use to get notifications about that. And next week we'll be talking about using a directional signal for managing risk in iron condor and other neutral trades, which is a, a good topic for recent market conditions. So thank you again very much, John, for doing this for us and teaching us more about the squeeze indicator, which is very popular. And uh, I, I feel like it is something that adds value to traders that need a little bit of directional uh, assistance with their, their trading. Great. Well, thank you, Andrew and Seth, for having me. And uh, good. have fun trading the rest of the week.